Great. So as indicated on the agenda, we've left uh, plenty of time for, uh, for discussion. And I, I think both uh, um, Dr. Stover and Dr. Brannon have really given the, the background thinking about this, in a sense, an emerging area that, that needs to be defined from a um, nutrient perspective. And um, I'm intrigued by this progression from general to disease state, from the individual to population. And I now, I'm thinking we shouldn't be talking about the population. We should be talking about the populations. And how do we define different populations so we can begin to think about the, the nutrient requirements? Um, and uh, just a, a variety of, uh, um, well, a, again, coming also back to that idea of we've tended to think in terms of treating disease. And as we understand that more of these populations are part of the general population, how do we think about managing, not treating or curing, but managing in a specific way? Um, so I, I see Tim, uh, Jinan, Tim beat you to the microphone. So, <laughs> <laughs> so if you would, because we do have the webinar population, if you would state your name and affiliation um, before asking a question or making a comment, that would be great. Sure. Uh, Tim Mark, Spectrum Nutrition. Patsy and Patrick, thank you for that very nice overview of the complexities, but also the challenges we're facing. I like especially the notion that we're talking about systems and processes and pathways, not just a single deficiency of a nutrient. And, and, that's, and, and then the, same, the corollary of that is, what do we mean by treating a disease with a drug versus managing a disease through nutrition? And I would just throw out not being an expert in this area, but drugs tend to be killers, and they damage cells that are diseased. And, but nutrients are regenerative, like you were saying with stem cells. And so aren't they really, if we were managing the disease, couldn't we think about helping restore the body's normal ability to do its own job of fighting disease? And that's still fighting disease, but it's empowering the body to do its job better. So then my last question is, a lot of talk about nutrient requirements. We have not yet defined what is a nutrient and how narrow is that versus how broad could that be. And pointing out that the, the National Academy's chronic disease endpoints uses the very interesting term of nutrients and other food substances, NOFs. So I hope that our thinking today in the concepts of the metabolic processes, we may be able to provide intermediaries to that process, which historically have not been known as a nutrient with a DRI associated, but might be very impactful in bypassing some of these damaged areas. So before, before we take the response, I'm going to get the, both the questions out there, and then we'll let you talk about uh, the multiple questions. So, Janan. Okay, thank you. you. Uh, Janan Stallings from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And first, to thank all of you. Uh, it is so rare for us to be sort of in a National Academy setting where we're thinking of clinical medicine and real applications in that setting all the way back to dietary guidelines for Americans and DRIs and all of the definitions, that sort of thing. So I really appreciate the work you've done and to have two days, day and a half together to think about this. So as I was sitting there wearing these two hats, um, the challenge for me, and I, I heard it maybe more clearly than I have in a long time, um, when you're less on the medical side, the idea that diseases are causing changes in nutrient requirements is not something we think of that much, except for meta, you know the, the classic uh, inborn errors of metabolism or something like that. And then the other two pieces that I think we'll be grappling with in this and for DRI applications on into the future is um, what is it about nutrition or dietary intake or nutrients 
that changes the risk of a, a group of people or a patient in getting the disease. So nutrition and cause. And then the third one is really nutrition and treatment, sort of what we were saying about could we do something nutritionally that's going to manage, uh, that's going to reduce the severity of the disease or slow down the progression of the disease. Um, and all of those are important, but it is a, your challenge about well, give us a framework that we can start to understand all of this, I think is really complex. So to me, the big distinction was the disease changing nutrition, and then often in clinical medicine, it's what can we use to, to modify. Mm -hmm. So Patsy and Patrick, I don't, uh, just taking the two comments that we've had from Janan and from Tim, do you want to? So I'll start a little bit. Um, and, and Tim, you ask a really good question. And so I like the term bioactive food components. And I think that that could well be important. Um, I could imagine that there could be a scenario in the way in which a disease affects um, nutritional requirements or metabolism such that a bioactive food component might have an important role to play um, in managing those effects, and it could influence um, nutrient distributions and other factors. But the other thing that it brings to mind, though, and I think this is far more complex and far more difficult than special nutritional requirements, and this workshop is not focused on this, what are special dietary guidelines? Because I think that the pattern of foods consumed could influence the response of nutrients because of small synergistic effects with bioactive food components. And that's way beyond the scope of this workshop, but I think it's an important aspect that at some point we may need to think about. Yeah, I can just comment on both of those. In terms of Tim's question about a systems approach and the idea that drugs kill and nutrients restore, which I love, um, this is where I think we can learn a lot from the aging community. So the people who are involved in aging are looking at things like epigenetic profiles as we age. That is, you know, our embryonic stem cells have this epigenetic landscape that really determines the dose of every gene and how much it is expressed. And we know as we age that the epigenetic profiles decay. And we know that with that decay is then you get more randomness in gene expression that then leads to functional decay in networks. And studies have been done, they're observational studies, but they look as people age. And there is a correlation between the rate of decay of gene expression patterns or epigenetic landscape and your risk for chronic disease. Those who decay, decay more rapidly tend to have chronic diseases. Those who are able to retain those epigenetic signatures and those gene expression profiles tend to age much more healthily. So they have a lower biological age than their chronological age. Um, so there's a lot of interest now in what is the role of nutrition. We know that nutrition is absolutely essential in establishing those embryonic epigenetic landscapes and all the work that's been done with the fetal origins of disease hypothesis and this and that, where we know what mom eats affects what the kid's epigenetic patterns are going to be in gene expression profiles. What we don't know in terms of the stem cells and the restoration is how we can use nutrition to really reprogram those stem cells so that they can repopulate an organ with a younger sort of gene expression pattern that leads to then more functional networks. Absolutely key. There's a lot of work going in in that area. But again, for this area, I think to really progress, we need to bring together the aging community and the nutrition community, because they're, they're looking at those sorts of questions. But again, from an aging perspective, not from an intervention type perspective. Um, and then the question about clinical practice, again, I'm not qualified to answer this, but one of the issues has been, how do you measure these? It's easy to measure serum, it's easy to measure, you know, any sort of a biomarker that's in a readily available tissue. When you have a tissue that's not readily available, right, something that is diseased, what are the proxies for the, the nutrient, for, for measuring nutrient status in that disease, in, in, in that diseased tissue? And then how do we go about thinking about interventions, again, that help manage that disease in a way, again, so it doesn't progress or you don't get comorbidities? Um, this is an area I think initially is going to have to be done in animals, and certainly we have interest in this. Um, but I, I think that 
finding those biomarkers so we can really begin to probe these questions are what's going to be key. Yeah, I, I think I would add to the discussion also, you know, it, it always intrigues me that when we look at nutrients, we don't consider fiber a nutrient. We've set an adequate intake for it, but it's not defined as a nutrient, which I think begs the question of how should we be defining nutrients and do we need to think about that framework as well. And I was intrigued with Janam with your question because I began to think about what Patrick used as examples with comorbidity where it's known that comorbidities exist and they need to be managed as part of the disease process, but we haven't necessarily thought about nutrients as part of that development of, of comorbidities. It's sort of an intriguing idea. So I'm going to take three more questions, and then we'll let the speakers respond. So, uh, Bruce Burnett, Nutrition and Medical Food Coalition, Red Hill Biopharma. Uh, Dr. Brown and Dr. Silver, thank you for your wonderful talks. I was interested in the, the connection between Dr. Brandon's talk with the DRI and also the biomarker talk, Dr. Stover, that you had, and getting to your point about fiber not being classified as nutrient, can you comment on other functional substances derived from foods that can be concentrated so that they are not necessarily in the DRI, but they do have an effect on biomarkers? I focus on diseases of the gut. So for example, whey proteins concentrated with TGF-beta. Uh, oral immunoglobulin formulations have been tested since 1972 for infectious enteropathy or IBD or even IBS, and probiotic formulations that you can't necessarily obtain the same mixtures from food, but if you put them together, they do provide uh, some management of disease. Even though people may still have the disease, they're able to have an effect on biomarkers and see a decrease in certain symptomology. Can you both comment on that, please? Yeah, I'm going to take three questions and then we'll come back. So, thanks, um, Barry Ritz, HM Innovations. I liked where that question's going, so I hesitate to bring back to the very basic nutrients. Um, but I, I actually appreciated very much starting with RDAs and uh, DRIs because I feel like we always apologize for reviewing that. But it was a very good way, I think, to start and frame today's conversation. It made me think of something in a way I hadn't before. So I just want to ask if, if this is perhaps what you were getting at. And it, both of you got to, um, the, made the point about not being able to meet these disease, uh, nutrient requirements of disease through diet alone. For something that has an RDA, you were showing the shifts in, in you know, distribution. If, if the need is above the RDA, then by definition, for that population, is that therefore not achievable through diet alone, if that's the recommended dietary target. So did you see what I'm asking? So by definition, if the requirement for disease is above the RDA, then does that mean it's not achievable through diet? Okay. And then we'll take the next question. Good morning. Allison Stiber from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. I have um, just two quick points. The first, Patrick, I'm, I have concerns about this idea that we need to have a moderate for the grade um, in terms of being able to come out with meaningful recommendations that will inform clinical practice. I think that um, in nutrition science and the way the grade methodology works, we have few large um, randomized clinical trials that will inform some of this work. And so that, I think, is a concern and just wonder if you have thoughts on that. And then the second is thinking about clinical practice and thinking about how to actually do this in a feasible way and, and implement this in a feasible way. You know, um, if any of the work or any of the discussions have included things like identifying manifestations um, of physical, you know, clinical manifestations, so looking at, at nutrition-focused physical exam findings, et cetera, as part of this work. There's not very much data. There's mm -hmm. just sort of old practice, and I wonder if um, that has informed any of the conversation, because that is already happening in the clinical um, realm, but is it connected to understanding the mechanism in the underlying disease states? Great. So we have a set of three very interesting questions about affecting other food substances. So, so go ahead. I'm going to comment on the issue of if a special nutritional requirement for a given diseased population or individuals within that population, as we're now sort of making the distinction, 
is above the RDA set for generally healthy populations, does that mean it can't be met by diet alone? And I think the answer to that is not necessarily. It's going to depend on the nutrient, what nutrient-dense forms of foods are available, whether dietary supplements are appropriate or not, and how you might approach it. Um, I think with toxicity, examples where it's lower and you might be looking at changes in the upper level, the same caveats go. So I don't think it's possible to answer that um, in general, um, but I think it's an important question that has to be considered as diseased populations with special nutritional requirements are defined by the evidence-based. And I want to comment on two aspects of what were raised about a moderate level of evidence and the issue of how do you implement that into clinical practice. So I'm not aware of a lot of work, as you noted, that links physical exams either by a physician or another healthcare practitioner or a registered dietitian nutritionist um, with special nutritional requirements. I think as we move forward, that's going to be a part of the translational research that might be um, necessary. I also think the thing that's going to be difficult is how to integrate um, validated biomarkers or surrogate endpoints um, into clinical practice and diagnosis, especially if they're not either usual samples, let's take cerebral spinal fluid, or if they're expensive tests, because I think that's where in the reality of the current healthcare climate is going to influence what can be done and how it needs to be done. In terms of the level of evidence, as I understand the grade, moderate does not necessarily mean that there are a lot of randomized clinical trials. Moderate evidence can be generated with congruent and consistent effects integrated across observational studies and randomized clinical trials, depending on the nature of the questions that are being asked to inform the systematic review and the nature of the evidence needed to be um, considered. I think one reason for moderate, and Patrick was on the committee and will probably comment on this, is um, what we've heard from policymakers, which is that to make policy on low evidence is very difficult in this climate. And I think that puts the burden on the nutrition research community, but it's a challenge as well as a burden. So those, those were my thoughts. So I'll just speak quickly to evidence. I was a member of that committee, so I'm not speaking for the committee, but I can just tell you the nature of some of the discussions. Number one, when you have a chronic disease endpoint, you are in the medical space, and GRADE is the standard for evaluation of medical data so and making recommendations. So we're in that medical space, um, and it was felt that if we're in the medical space, we should adhere to the, you know, the, the, the principles that are used in medicine, number one. Number two, Again, if the, the nutrition community has been saying for years that, you know, the, that the sharp increase in chronic disease is related to diet, right? And so if we are going to make recommendations based on chronic disease endpoints and people follow our recommendations and chronic disease rates don't go down, we have a big problem. And so therefore, it was felt that we do need a high standard of evidence if, again, the goal is to connect diet to health. Um, in terms of what moderate level of evidence needs means, you can have a well-designed um, observational study that includes dose response, and it grades as moderate. So it does not preclude observational evidence. It just has to adhere to certain principles. So I mean, I, I for one, am supportive of using grade and a moderate level of evidence. But there was a lot of discussion around that. In terms of the question about the gut and gut nutrition, um, you know, this goes back to the question of what is a nutrient that Tim Mork raised, because it is a real question. How do we think about what is a nutrient and what are combinations of nutrients outside of what we have in food? Because again, special nutritional requirements may not be able to be met by diet alone. So how do we think about formulations? And of course, when you talk about the gut, we have to understand that organ called the microbiome that's dynamic, the changes that, you know, may signal, certainly metabolizes, has all of these other functions. 
And so we're not going to understand the connection between, you know, nutrition, gut health, and, and overall physiological health until we really understand what the microbiome is doing, how what we eat affects the microbiome, and then how in turn the microbiome supports human health. But I fully agree that we have to consider a range of substances, their combinations, and then come up with, if we do come up with a framework of how we really define what nutrients are in that context. I would like to add just a couple of additional comments. Um, I serve on the WHO NUGAG committee, which uses the grade process for evaluating evidence. And WHO has always recognized that one step is grading the evidence, the strength of the evidence, but then one can also look at the strength of the recommendation that is based on the evidence. That there, it's two separate steps to look at the evidence and then look at the recommendation and how strongly or weakly you can make a recommendation. And I, I do want to come back on that first point around the um, other food substances that can affect biomarkers. I think one of the critical needs in this area, and it's a critical need for nutrition in general, is the importance of validated biomarkers. And I know for a regulatory process, it's particularly important that those biomarkers be surrogate endpoints, that um, if, they, if they can't serve as a surrogate endpoint of the disease or the medical condition, then they may be useful from an experimental point of view, but they may not be useful as a biomarker that helps you in a regulatory framework. Um, so we'll, I think yeah. we have time for another round of questions. Well, so I, I really just wanted to make a comment since Victor Herbert's name came up. Uh, I'm one of the surviving members of the Victor Herbert fan club, and there are several <laughs> people in this audience. And, you know, and if Victor were here, remember Victor was an interventionalist and a very conservative one. He would say, where's the meat? Uh -huh. uh, we are looking at a difference in the traditional DRIs of a risk elimination model, and now we're trying to apply this to risk reduction models in which most people can't even fundamentally decide on what the endpoints are, as both Patsy and Patrick said in different ways, requirements for what, okay? Other than all-cause mortality, you know, we, you don't get into debate on that, and I think we're just... We, we don't, we still haven't, we don't have formal systematic reviews of the requirements for the normal population, except in the recent things that Patsy mentioned for calcium and vitamin D. And those are, I would say, partial systematic reviews. So we have a long way to go with traditional DRIs, and we're wandering off into a space far bigger than, you know, where no man has gone before. <laughs> Please. Claudia Morris from Emory. Thank you. Those are wonderful talks. Um, I do have a practical question of translating this to patients. So when you identify a distinct nutritional requirement, and let's fast forward to the point where we can show that this is going to reverse disease, and my experience has been in arginine and sickle cell disease. But we have a path, if you call that nut nutrient a drug, to work with the FDA to get it approved so you can get it to patients. But when it remains as a nutrition or nutritional intervention, there really isn't a path right now. I mean, I know that there's medicinal foods and such, but it's very challenging to get this to the patient. And what other options do you suggest for the clinician who's trying to make that leap? <laughs> And we'll take uh, um, one more. Go ahead. Uh, OK. Well, welcome to my world, I was going to say, because that is our life in inherited metabolic diseases. We have some misgivings about having even something as important as arginine become a drug, because then it mess makes it difficult when it's actually a required nutrient in rare diseases. Um, yet we want it better accessible just as you do. So end of, end of that comment. Um, my concern was with regard to the rare disease space and the strategies for achieving adequate power um, with regard to evidence. Um, this is something that we've struggled with incredibly mightily, even in the most common of rare inherited metabolic diseases. The number of patients accessible for appropriate studies, even observational studies, is limited. And so it makes it very difficult to accomplish 
what I would regard as an important but very high standard um, in um, nutrition requirements. Um, PKU is probably the one we're going to hear most about because it's the one we've known about longest and have the most evidence for. And even there, our evidence base is pitifully small. So I'm so looking forward to seeing how we can accomplish a more rigorous um, evidence base for and, rare disease spaces. And, and just for the record, would you state name and affiliation? Oh, I, my I, apologies. I, I'm Sue Berry from the University of Minnesota. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, Patrick and I had a quick consult, and we're going to defer the question of the regulatory space to you <laughs> because it is outside of both my scope of practice and expertise and outside of Patrick's uh, expertise. So just to let you know. And then I wanted to comment a little bit about the issue of um, how do you approach doing studies like this? And you're going to hear later tomorrow about novel designs, including intervention trials with an N of 1. And I think this is one of the real challenges and something that I'm intrigued by some of the innovative thinking that's going on and may help us think about how to approach uh, rare uh, frequent uh, diseases with rare frequencies or low prevalence and small uh, sample sizes. So I'll just quickly comment, um, given the Sue's um, concern about power calculations and Denny's concern about why are we even in this space, um, which makes me think, you know, we have to address this really because 50% of the population may have a chronic disease. Chronic diseases aren't going away, so if we're going to understand nutrient needs, we have to be in this space and focusing just on healthy people when we have this other you know, major population who's unhealthy, I, I don't think that we can ignore that. Um, and we won't have the power issues that we have with inborn errors in metabolism when we talk about chronic disease. But it does raise another question. I think when we were planning this, and I don't mean to speak for the group again, but we were thinking of inborn errors in metabolism sort of as a potential example or model of best practices we may want to follow. But it seems through going through this process of organizing this session that the inborn errors in metabolism field has its own problems. Um, and that maybe we should be thinking broadly about loss of function and address, not use inborn errors in metabolism as an example that we may want to emulate or learn from, but rather think broadly about loss of function in all of its manifestations and include inborn errors in metabolism in whatever, in whatever process we think about in developing special nutritional requirements for chronic disease. Great. And no one said you could talk to each other during that. <laughs> um, I, I do want to comment on this last point and the point that um, Denny made. It, I, I do think it is important to be looking at this area that I, I think we've gone through periods where some of these chronic diseases meant a shorter lifespan. And as we've learned either through therapeutic approaches or through nutrition management approaches, how people can have a longer life and can improve their quality of life, we really need to be able to understand what are the frameworks to, to help in those situations and make sure that we're addressing it in a scientifically rigorous way. Um, yeah, so one of the advantages of being retired from FDA is you can comment on uh, <laughs> regulatory aspects. And I, I think you raise exactly the dilemma that I think this field is now faced with, that if indeed you're going, FDA will say categorically, treat, cure, prevent, or manage disease makes you a drug or a medical device, and that, that's the framework you need to go into. And so we created, a, you know, the Orphan Drug Act created this space called medical foods um, and if you go back, there was a Federal Register notice in 1996 that FDA published, which really outlined its thinking about what is a medical food, what's a food for special dietary use. Um, it was a proposed, it was a, a notice of, advance notice of proposed rulemaking, so it could take comments. Because FDA could not complete the work on that, it was eventually withdrawn. But the thinking is really incredible. And to me, it begs the question, right now we have health claims. 
There is a process by which you submit a petition. FDA reviews that, comes up with a decision to deny it, to qualify it, to put it into regulation. But for a medical food, it's self-declared that you're a medical food. And where is the space that we look and evaluate the claims that might be made for a medical food? Right now, it's done through the, the regulatory action process. If FDA sends a warning letter, you're given notice that they didn't agree with your determination of a medical food. So I don't have a solution for it, but I, I think it really points to the dilemma we're faced with right now. If, if this concept of special nutrient requirements is indeed something that we can continue to build and understand in a definable way, and if medical foods are a part of that, do we need to have some sort of framework that allows us to, to do it in a way that the, the public can be confident in what's being provided and the kind of claims being made. So a lot of questions there, but not a lot of answers. Did you? We'll yes, take hi. one last, and then uh, it'll be hi. break time. My name is Nadia Casey. I'm with the Health Care Nutrition Council. Just along with the lines that, that we're speaking of right now, um, certainly looked at the thought of public health and individual approach and, of course, um, patient-centered. As we move toward, right, defining, um, you know, SND and, and really scoping out the details with SNR, my question really is, do we, are we concerned that we may limit our, our innovative um, abilities to meet individual needs of certain patients? Patrick, do you want to? We can talk more about this. I mean, so, I mean, one of the questions is, is can you classify subgroups of a clinical population that will respond the same way? That we, we have biomarkers of disease that predict a nutritional deficiency, and we can, you know, that's disease induced, and then we can somehow come up with a dose response relationship that suggests that they do have a special nutritional requirement. I think what you're talking about is going to be driven by some of the disruptive technologies, and I'll talk about this later. But the same paper microfluidic device that enables the pregnancy test are now being commercialized with chronic disease markers, with nutritional status markers, and this and that. So people are going to have a lot of individual data on their own health that's going to extend far beyond how many steps they took today, but they're going to get real-time readouts of their physiological status, their disease status. So, you know, that's a, your question's a good one. Is this really an N of one type situation where we can't really apply any sort of a, a population type framework to? Or is it going to be more about the individual clinical case that are so different that, that we can't, you know, classify? But then on the other hand, again, individuals are going to have this information. They're going to know their chronic disease state. They're going to know stuff about their nutritional status. And who's going to tell them what to do? What's their cell phone going to tell them? Yeah, and I would comment if we think 20, 30 years in the future, everybody's going to be walking around with subcutaneous biosensors that are going to be <laughs> transmitting all this information to the cloud and available to their health care providers. So I think that. What we may be looking at is a period of time when we're transitioning. We'll always need public health approaches, but we're also going to be trans transitioning to personalized nutrition. And do we have enough information right now? We could debate that. I, I think there's a lot more we need to learn. But some of what you're asking will be easier to do when we understand better the diet, gene, environment interactions and can really think about personalized nutrition on an individual level. And although there are a few examples for specific monogene traits right now where that can be done, there are a few examples. There aren't a widespread. Yeah, I, I would just add a comment that you know, when I think of the discussions around personalized nutrition 10, 20 years ago, it seemed very pie in the sky. I think where we've seen advances in genetic understanding, metabolic understanding, some of which I hope comes out in our discussion in the workshop, it really begins to take on a, a, a more realistic 
focus of being able to define smaller populations where you can look at unique or special nutrient needs. So I think we're really at a cusp where perhaps the, the next iteration as we think about personalized nutrition helps us define it in a way that is more meaningful to, to people. Um, I, I would say I'm also concerned as we keep moving with the technology, how does it get validated? How, how do we make sure that the consumer, the public, can be confident that the kind of information they're getting is in fact accurate and meaningful for decision making? I think there are a lot of challenges in that area as well. So with that, I'm going to ask you to help thank our speakers once again. <laughs> This has been a great discussion, and um, it's only the first two first sessions, so um, we have a break that um, you need to be back at 10:20, and then we'll start session two.